So uh, thank you for coming here today. And sorry I'm late. Um, uh, for uh, those who are not, uh, you know, Greek speakers, the title is a ancient Greek saying that uh, parental sins come to haunt the kids. And uh, I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to describe today about what is happening in uh, Greece and the Greek crisis. With uh, in terms of, I think what's been going on right now is just a passing on of uh, debt over hand. Essentially, passing on the bucket to the next generation. Now, um, before I do that, uh, Inola will attempt to uh, outline briefly what has been going on and interpret it from a perspective that is uh, definitely not mainstream. It's not what you see uh, many media outlets and uh, politicians nowadays uh, are saying what they love to hate, in the sense that I will argue that um, how and why we got to where we are today is, uh, is uh, neither the reasons for, what, uh, for arriving to where we are today are neither structural nor cultural. Of course, you know, societies, economies, and nations uh, grow and decline. They go into golden eras and dark eras because of uh, political institutions, cultural traits, and economic structures. But these are usually uh, very medium or long-term processes. Sovereign debt crises, on the other hand, do occur usually in very short period of times. And therefore, they really what they have to do is with decisions, strategic decisions, taken at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. So really, my argument today will be that um, we found ourselves where we are today because of three factors that are unfortunately too human, irresponsible greed, incompetence and irrationality, which I'm going to be used euphemistically for stupidity most of the time. <laughs> so, um, you know, the story, the Greek story starts, looks a bit like this actually. Okay, so uh, this is our debt to GDP ratio from uh, 1980 to 2000. Uh, these are some estimates, 2015 and 16. This is IMF data. And, uh, you know, what you see here, I will basically I will start my story from um, this point here, 2000, with uh, the main regime changing event that happened in Greece, and this was the introduction of the euro. Now, what the euro did in Greece, as in many countries actually in Europe, is um, it changed fundamentally the relative prices. Why? Because on the one hand, you had uh, suddenly a drop in interest rates. Essentially, uh, the real real estate in Greece became negative from uh, somewhere around 8 to 10 percent. Now, this means that the relative price of money came essentially down to zero. So that's one price distortion. The second price distortion is, you know, the European Central Bank and the Bank of Greece usually all this time have been worrying about price stability, inflation. Now, inflation is the change in absolute prices. But an economist really cares about what happens to relative prices. And then with the introduction of the euro, you had a sudden increase in uh, those sectors, in the prices, in sectors that were protected from competition. So therefore, non-tradable goods and services. So these prices went up a lot relative to other sectors of the economy. And this meant, of course, that you had an economic distortion in the sense that, you know, a couple increased prices in the non-tradable goods and services with very cheap money and free capital flows. And what I find is that, you know, in economies, money, which is a liquid asset, tends to behave a bit like water. It goes into the areas where profit can be made easier and more quickly. So you have the, you know, the entire economy being distorted towards sectors like real estate, construction, uh, tourism, uh, imports, especially high-end luxury goods because you have a very high profit margin. All these are sectors where money can be made easy, and so it was the case. Of course, these are the sectors that do not increase the productive capacity of the economy, because these are just services consumption, right? It's not really production. So this is the one thing. Now, the second thing that happened is that these changes in relative prices, of course, affected also the behavior of the government. Because, you know, if you are the government, you find a very easy way to boost the aggregate demands. 
by increasing salaries, by increasing pressures, severance payments, and subsidies. And of course, coupled that with the, uh, the famous Delors package that uh, in the case of this amounted altogether to roughly 60 billion euros. And you have a very easy way for the government to be boosting the aggregate demand. Now, the next element um, that, that happened, um, and now we'll come to this, yeah. Um, no, let me just keep on showing the, the dead picture for a minute. <laughs> and so the next thing that happened, and this was, uh, again, not only, it was not the entirely Greek characteristic, it was something that was sanctioned essentially for Brussels, is that you had a change in the composition of tax revenues. Because there was a move to um, reduce income and corporate taxation and replace the revenues with taxing consumption, VAT, indirect taxation. Now, of course, we all know that indirect taxation is regressive, but forget about this. What is the real problem, in my view, with indirect taxation is that, A, as a government, you have an incentive to increase consumption, because this is what you're taxing, and B, Indirect taxation is pro-cyclical in terms of macroeconomic shocks. When the economy is booming and money are flowing around, business find it easy to pay the VAT because you have the cash. When you go into recession, and especially when you credit constraint that was going on now, the first thing that the, that the business will not do is pay the VAT because this is cash that you want to keep for yourself if you're cash constrained. So what, uh, you know, what I've what I think I have uh, starting to outline here is that there is a series of political and economic strategic decisions that happen that the consequences of which could be foreseen and led us to where we are today. Of course, you know, the next big event in the case of Greece was uh, the Olympic Games. Now, we were the smallest country ever to host the Olympic Games. Now, given that most of the cost of the Olympic Games are fixed in the sense that you have to do a given list of things, and typically you have to buy a given list of things from a given list of companies, what you get is that relative to GDP, these were the most costly Olympics ever. Now, the Olympics took place, as you know, in 2004, and actually this is the next big event that happened after the Olympics, the really big event in my story, is uh, that Mr. Karamanis came to power. <laughs> now, this was, you know, I don't want to be political, and I don't really have to, because I think everyone and the grandmother at the moment converges on the view that this was a national disaster of ethnic proportions. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you can see clearly this figure, but basically, what I want to tell you, the story that, you know, what the message that you should take from this figure is that up to 2004, we were running budget deficits, but we were running structural budget surpluses. Moreover, we were always, the tax revenues were more than the forecasted ones. So the government was always collecting more taxes than he thought it would collect. Starting with 2004, everything went out of the window. Basically, the uh, Karamanis uh, era, essentially, if you add up the deficit between 2004 and 2009, you end up with a figure of $109 billion, $109.5 to be exact. You know, according to my estimates, because the, the numbers are a bit fuzzy here. But basically, $109 billion is exactly the amount of the first bailout package, to give you, to give you an idea. Essentially, um, and here is the picture, I think, I have it. Um, okay, now, the other thing that happened during the Karamanis era is that actually the maturity profile of the Greek bonds changed. There was a conscious decision to shorten the maturity of the Greek bonds. Why? Because, you know, the government was running huge deficits, they wanted to borrow money, and they had to borrow money the cheapest way possible. And at the time, usually, in any way, the cheap way to reduce your uh, borrowing costs is by shortening the time of your debt. And here you see the picture that essentially could tell you from 2007, 2008 at most, <coughs> that the whole thing is going to blow up in 2012 and 2013. 
Because if you end up these numbers, it is over a hundred billion dollars. That is more than two thirds of the country's GDP. It would be coming up for payment in those years. Now, another thing that happened during that era that it is important for today, and is relevant in the discussion that we hear about, you know, that the problems of the Greek economy are structural and cultural, like Greeks don't pay taxes, is that one of the main elements in Karamanlis's political agenda was that people shouldn't pay taxes. If you remember in the 2004 elections, the main element is that you know, taxes are a harachi, the famous Karamanlis term. And I think that, you know, okay, Greeks don't pay that much taxes, that's true. But I think in any country in the world, and in any country, in any planet, I think, if you go, if the political citizenship would tell the citizens that not only you don't have to pay taxes, but really you shouldn't pay taxes, then I don't think anybody would pay taxes. So, you know, the, the, why, you know, the reason, the main reason for why... Can I, can I just yeah. ask a, a very brief question? Yeah. The, uh, the maturity, the, the, the increase in the uh, maturity of uh, votes in 2011, 12, and 13, mm -hmm. Would it be right to assume that uh, a, a lot of that would have been the majority of 10-year uh, uh, bonds that uh, Greece issued in the immediate aftermath of its uh, entry? No, I will show you. No, no, no not really. I or is it really you. short term? Because that, that, that's a no. These are really short term because one. I mean, one of the reasons, to, one of the ways to check is that if you end up these numbers, they are exactly the deficits that the government ran from 2004 and 2009. I mean, okay, maybe you were overrolling all debt. You have to do that all the time. But you definitely had an increase in debt over those years. And these are exactly the numbers that uh, we get up. So, you know, what I'm saying is that, okay, maybe some part of this debt was the debt that was issued in maybe in the 90s. Fine, but the point is that you knew that this debt, you would have to pay it in 2012 and 2013. So in that sense, you know, you knew that you shouldn't borrow. Right now, um, but here is actually uh, uh, something relevant, I think, to your question. Uh, this is what I have calculated here: is the outstanding Greek bonds by year of issue. So you see here that we have a tremendous spike of issuance. So this is new debt that was issued these years. And I think put these two slides together. They, uh, you know, they do, they do show you that clearly the new debt was issued and it was actually short term. It was five years and seven years bonds. Now, um, okay, so um, so this is basically the, uh, you know, the the Karamalis. Uh, how much time do I have? Minus, minus, minus five minutes. So four minutes. <laughs> four minutes. Okay. So uh, now this is uh, this slide actually shows you the external factors in the picture. The external factors of the picture being the bond markets. And what you should take away from this picture is that you know it is not really the financial crisis of 2008 that triggered the great events because actually the bond markets were quite late to react to the great bond. I mean to to stop lending. They really stopped lending very late in 2009, beginning of 2010, if you want. Now, so the question is, what were, in my view at least, the important external factors in this story? And this is, the external factor in the story is Mrs. Merkel. Why is Mrs. Merkel? Because when we got to the point where we couldn't borrow anymore, so we couldn't turn over our debts, the bailout comes. And the bailout decision, what is the unique element in this decision, is the involvement of the IMF. So the question is, who actually decided to involve the IMF? Now at the time, famously, uh, the then Prime Minister, Mr. Papandreou, took the, uh, what he thought was the acclaim for the time, right? But uh, actually I think no Prime Minister of any small country like Greece, and not even any IMF director would ever take this decision of being involved in the European Union 
without actually the decision being sanctioned by the country that would put up most of the money, and this is Germany. The question is why Mrs. Merkel wanted to involve the IMF. And actually, if you remember at the time, that was opposed quite fiercely and quite publicly by the central bank, because the European Central Bank didn't want the IMF to be involved in European affairs. So the question is why? Because the main operational mantra of the IMF, wherever it goes, is that it needs to make sure that its funds are going to get repaid with interest. Right? The IMF is not the World Bank. The IMF behaves a bit like a bank itself. right? And this is exactly what the aim of Mrs. Merkel was, at least at the time. Mrs. Merkel would have to call upon the German taxpayer to fund this bailout operation, and she wanted to be sure right in my view, as any politician should do, that uh, the funds that the German taxpayer would have to pay out would be repaid, at least that the German taxpayer would be, would be made to believe that they would be repaid with interest. So this is the story how we arrived at the, at the bailout. Now, the problem with the bailout plan was precisely that mostly the, the aim was to ensure that the debtors would be paid, that essentially you wouldn't default now. And the bailout itself as a macroeconomic plan had two elements that are quite problematic in my view. The first element was that its main idea, its main diagnosis rather, was that the Greek problem was a problem of deficits, not of debt. So what we should do is you should reduce your budget deficits and you should do it quickly. How you do that quickly? You drastically cut expenditures and you drastically increase taxes or try to increase tax revenues. Now, unfortunately, because precisely they had at the same time to send a signal to the debtors that they would get repaid, they did that by supporting with a huge amount of new debt. Now, this is an oxymoron if you think about it, because debt and deficits are more or less equivalent concepts. A deficit is nothing but new debt. So if you try to argue that I'm going to reduce my deficit, but at the same time I'm going to do it by acquiring new debt, you made a hole in the water. And you see that the markets were not very late to realize that, that you were making a hole in the water. So these were the first elements in the bailout. The second element that is problematic in the bailout plan is the fact that, and this was actually uh, mentioned before, there is this perception that countries can grow their way out of debt. And uh, the Rogoff and Reinhardt uh, book is a very nice book that essentially its main message is that no country ever has grown its way out of debt. It is simply impossible to do it especially if you're running the, the amount of, uh, you know, the debt-to-GDP ratio that we are doing uh, right now. So uh, basically to, I have like two minutes. So basically to close, you know, where we are right now is, um, you know, this was a slide to, to tell you that uh, how people are basically falling all the time behind the events in this story. Like, you know, wrong decision, wrong forecast, wrong predictions. And um, what the new, the second bailout plan has done now is, as, uh, as was already mentioned, we uh, got uh, a write-off of $100 billion, but a new debt of $130 billion. So we are plus $30 billion more debt than we are before. And this was done essentially to change the maturity profile of the current debt. Remember the picture that I showed you before, all the debt was exploding here. Now we have tried to smooth it out up to 2040. Now, how, why we want to do that? Because this buys time for the current political leadership, I think, to retire, to retire. Not only political, but also economic and business elites to retire. And of course, the current retirees to die, either of them relatively in peace. And what you are doing now is essentially pushing the bucket, you're pushing the bucket to the next generation. And uh, there is an element here that you know people haven't really paid attention to, I think. One is that the write-off, it's not even $100 billion if you think about it, because a good chunk of this 
is uh, a right of debt that the government owes to the social security funds. So what you did in this sense is that you took money from one pocket and you put it to another pocket. Because as you know in Greece, as in many countries, the social security system is funded on the pay-as-you-go basis. Actually, no. In Greece, as in many countries now, it is funded in a, a pay-as-you-borrow basis. <laughs> so now, essentially, what we have is that our generation and the generation after that, and possibly even the generation of my newborn uh, son, is uh, find itself between a, hard, a rock and a hard place. Because you have all these debt obligations that you will have to pay at the point, at some point. You don't have essentially any social security left. So the very social contract of the country is, in, is in, uh, up in the air at the moment. You have these laws that I think that could become now European laws of uh, having to run budget structural budget surpluses, or at least zero uh, budget in the structural sense. And here you should ask also set the question, not why governments run deficits, but why governments should run deficits. The deficit, it's not really a bad thing if you manage it well, right? The deficit is like credit leverage for a private company, right? It allows you to weather the storms and to smooth consumption, welfare, between good shocks and bad shocks. So essentially now, by law, our generation will be obliged to essentially be credit constrained in this sense. Okay. And then the third issue that is now being going on, I think, uh, in, uh, in the leadership circles in, in leadership circles in Europe, has to do with uh, the immigration problem. You know, Greece, as you may well know, as well as Italy, face a huge problem of immigrants. And these are immigrants that they're not going to be assimilated, they're not going to be even to participate in the labor force because they didn't come neither to Greece nor to Italy to work. These guys are going through, they're trying to get to Germany, to England, to the powerhouses of Europe. And you are left with a big, a very big number of these guys who, you know, they will need at some point healthcare, they will need some social safety nets, they will set some provisions. So these are extra costs that our generation has to take on. So, you know, to close, I went uh, a lot of overtime. Uh, I think, you know, ah, and here as I have a, an industry picture that, uh, you know, you have my take of the situation where we are at the moment. This is the market stake of the situation of where we are at the moment. This is after the restructuring. And uh, this is taken from uh, Bloomberg. It is the discount on the new Greek government bonds that expire 27, 32, 42, and so on and so forth. Now, if you take into account the fact that these are the discounts on bonds that have been already uh, subjected to a haircut of 53%, it turns out that the market believes that these bonds are worth at the moment 10% to 13.5% of face value, depending on the maturity of the bond. So basically, the market also, I think, takes the view but that what you have done is simply pushing out the debt to the next generation in a way that is clearly not going to be sustainable in the long run. So this is, uh, sorry, I went overboard. <laughs>